Welcome back to In-Depth Literature, everyone's favorite place on the internet. Today we're going to be covering Tennessee Williams' epic, A Streetcar Named Desire. It's actually not that long. It's a pretty short play, but it's very dense. A Streetcar Named Desire is all-encompassing. It encompasses sort of the sort of the death of, of Southern values, right? That's essentially what, uh, ten, or what uh, I almost said, Tennyson, Tennessee Williams is kind of getting at, but it's also the fall of Blanche Dubois, and it's about the fall of love, and it's sort of about the masculine and feminine conflicts that come into play between Stanley Kowalski and Blanche Dubois. So we're going to st really start to unpack uh, the brilliance behind Tennessee Williams' A Streetcar Named Desire. So A Streetcar Named Desire, you know, if you've read the play, I think that's great, and I really think you should read the play, and if, also if you've seen the movie, that's really great too. There's been a couple different renditions editions of, of Streetcar. The classic one that's featured on the cover here is obviously Vivian Lee, Marlon Brando. Great performance. You know, I think the, 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 the context of the play, not that it's extremely difficult to, to sort of, you know, show on the stage or show on the screen, but if you've only seen the movie, you have to read the play because that's really where it, everything kind of falls into place. There's so many hidden details in the play that maybe we're just brushed uh, across on screen or on stage. My experience with Streetcar, my mother was in fact, um, you know, used to, to play Blanche Dubois on some local uh, regional stages. So something about Streetcar is kind of in my blood. I was born in New Orleans. My mother was fascinated by the character Blanche Dubois. Uh, so I digress, but just kind of interesting sort of family connection to, to Streetcar Named Desire. And I think a lot of women can kind of relate to this character, perhaps a lot of Southern women. I, I guess we could possibly say that there's an element of toxic masculinity uh, in terms of how Stanley Kowalski is sort of portrayed. He sort of embodies what we would call in modern times toxic masculinity. I don't really think that's necessarily a thing, but Stanley Kowalski, if toxic masculinity was a thing, Stanley Kowalski would be it. And his sort of temperament, clashes completely with that of Blanche Dubois and sort of you've got sort of acting as a buffer is is Stella Blanche's sister and Stanley's wife that you know she sort of acts as this go-between she's trying to play both sides of Blanche Dubois she's trying to stay loyal to her sister but she's also you know completely head over heels in love with Stanley and there's just this three-way really toxic but oftentimes unspoken conflict that really comes into play and basically from the first page or the first scene of the play Tennessee Williams demonstrates for us that Blanche Dubois is going to the the neighborhood Elysian Fields or maybe that's the name of the apartment complex where Stella and Stanley Kowalski are residing and Elysian Fields in ancient Greek mythology is sort of the mythological afterlife, right, of, of sort of upright souls, of, of virtuous souls, right? So in a sense, Blanche Dubois, from the beginning of the play, you could look at it as if she's already dead, at least on a spiritual level. This is sort of Blanche Dubois' last resting place. This is the last place where, the last location where she is seeking refuge from the storm of life. And she's got sort of a shady background, right, that sort of comes in, a, that occurs, or comes up rather, later in the play. And but also Blanche Dubois is sort of a mystery woman. You know, we get all this back sort of back scenery, this backstory about the the plantation that was owned by Blanche's parents and was I think later inherited by Blanche Dubois. And somewhere along the line, obviously Stella sort of went her own way and married Stanley. And Blanche Dubois was sort of held responsible for the plantations, but it got too expensive and she lost the plantation and she was sort of a wandering soul, sort of a wandering, struggling female archetype in sort of the backstory of, of, of Streetcar, right? And she sort of shows up to Elysian Fields with you know, to, to meet her sister and Stanley, but she's got all this background baggage. She's got all this skeletons in her closet, right? And it's kind of creepy in that sense that she's going to a place called Elysian Fields, you know, the last resting place for, for upright, virtuous souls. But that in itself comes into conflict with Blanche Dubois' character because at this point in Blanche Dubois' life, she is neither virtuous nor upright. 
you know, nor ethical, um, but she's still struggling with the death of her, her, her values, her Southern values, her personal values. And it's very, very complex. So we're just going to kind of unpack some of the major scenes, analyze some of the major scenes. And obviously my, you know, if you guys have seen some of my other analysis, they're not super plot driven. So I don't think there's going to be too many spoilers. I'm not going to tell you everything that's going to occur in the play, uh, but we're going to sort of dissect the most important themes so that you guys can have sort of a nice foundation when you go to watch the film or when you go to read the play, as you hopefully will, of Tennessee Williams' Streetcar Named Desire. So in a nutshell, we sort of have this wandering Blanche Dubois character who's struggling with her values. She sort of was once a, a virtuous Southern belle, and she's sort of fallen from grace, right? And that's kind of where the whole play sort of um, starts to, to sort of, you know, introduce itself. And then briefly on page 13, uh, Blanche sort of gets into a conflict with Stella and she's sort of confronting Stella on sort of leaving the family heritage, leaving Blanche all on her own at the plantation. And Blanche Dubois goes into these monologues about death. And she claims that all she witnessed was death and that she was, you know, shocked and just terribly depressed by all the death that sort of uh, transpired. So not only is Blanche Dubois attempting to, to sort of reinvent herself and she's trying to, she's in the process of a rebirth, but she cannot quite shake the skeletons of her past. She cannot quite shake the trauma of her past. Blanche Dubois is a very damaged, sort of traumatic character in that sense. And we really get that. And then shortly into the play, Stanley Kowalski sort of finds out about the business dealings or lack thereof, uh, the lack of paperwork that exists with Blanche Dubois' plantation. I forgot what the plantation is called. It was called Bell Bell Rev, actually, Bell Reeve. And Stanley Kowalski, you know, goes on to this monologue about the Napoleonic Code. Here in New Orleans, we have something called the Napoleonic Code. Whatever the in, whatever is inherited by the wife or the sister is also inherited by the husband. So he goes on this sort of monologue about, you know, he sort of starts to sort of demand from Blanche that she show the receipts uh, about what happened to Bell Rev. And, you know, because he really wants in on that lost money, that lost opportunity. And he sort of starts to ransack Blanche Dubois' belongings. And he goes through all of her stuff. And they sort of have this back and forth. And basically from the beginning, from the get-go, Blanche and, and Stanley are sort of clashing, right? Because Blanche Dubois is obviously a, a character that's in the process of falling from grace. So Stanley kind of shows up or, or he's, he's kind of written as a character to sort of not only confront Blanche Dubois' sort of secrecy, right, but also her, her sort of alleged Southern dignity uh, or lack thereof. Stanley is a challenging character that sort of sort of tries to unveil within Blanche who Blanche really is and who she's sort of hiding behind this veil, behind this facade that she is one person, but she's kind of living a secret life, right? That's kind of another aspect of this play. Like I said, Blanche and Stanley are not, you know, very well acquainted. They, they don't hit it off. We'll, we'll say it that way. But Stanley, you know, he, he's kind of based, right? He's sort of like this red-pilled kind of guy, I guess we could say. And he, he's sort of having this back and forth about uh, seduction or, or dating you know, and sort of how men and women are attracted to each other. And he goes on this monologue and he says, compliments to women about their looks. I never met a woman that didn't know if she was good looking or not without being told. And some of them give themselves credit for more than they've got. And so he's challenging not only Blanche Dubois sort of feminine values, but he's sort of challenging that aspect of, of sort of male submission perhaps to, to sort of the female seductive archetype, the female power, you know, the, so he's, he's challenging that whole idea of what it means to seduce a woman. You know, Stanley's sort of this cold hearted beige, I guess you could say, um, sort of overly confident, masculine, Polish man. He's not going to play ball with Blanche really at all. And then on, on page 23, as this conflict sort of starts to, to progress, we are, I'm not going to tell you the entire backstory because, you know, I don't want to spoil everything for y'all, but we come to the understanding that Blanche Dubois had a former lover that is now deceased. I'm not going to get into the, the full nitty gritty because it would not be as interesting for you guys to read it. But Blanche Dubois is carrying this extreme 
depression, this extreme trauma from her her past of this former lover that was that she kind of scorned, and that this man inadvertently uh, scorned her by. So, well, I'll put it this way. He sort of had an affair, but it's not your average affair. It's a more interesting sort of affair. And you got to remember, too, um, if you guys know anything about our friend Tennessee Williams here, you know, a play written by a homosexual man, it has a huge influence on on Tennessee Williams' worldview as a homosexual man. It, you know, it, it, it comes up constantly in his plays, all the way from Streetcar to Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, all the way to some of his, his later stuff, you know. And, and I think that's valid, right? I'm not saying that as a form of criticism, but it, it is a part of the analysis. And I think uh, there is a tendency from, from just, I'm, and I'm, this might just be a broad statement, but there's some level of, at least when it comes to Tennessee Williams, or at least when it comes to some gay men, some homosexual men, that there is a almost sort of a, a latent resentment of women, right? You know, because maybe they want to be a woman or they can't quite connect with women and they're sort of struggling and they're sort of pretending to date, uh, uh, you know, women, but secretly they want to be with men. And sort of this this hidden homoerotic idea or this homoerotic philosophy that is sort of repressed in gay men is definitely a theme in Streetcar Named Desire, and it goes back to sort of this affair that I'm, that I'm talking about. Um, so before I give too much away as far as that goes, you know, um, Tennessee Williams' worldview, it's hard not to talk about his homosexuality because it influenced a lot of his characters, but it's so brilliantly done because he chose to write about a woman. He didn't, this, this play is not about a homosexual man, it's about a woman, a heterosexual woman, but she is closely associated with the homosexual experience. So that's something to really keep in mind when you're reading Streetcar. And you'll also learn that, and this probably manifests itself a little better in visually or on stage or on the film because you can actually hear it, but whenever she is thinking about this traumatic relationship, this polka music starts to play. And after a while, you start to understand that it's only Blanche Dubois is hearing this polka music. And what the polka music is is sort of a, a manifestation of Blanche Dubois' fallen innocence, her heartbroken innocence, um, her, her fall from grace, the loss of her love. And then uh, sort of on page 33, and, and I also forgot to mention that when, when Stanley and Blanche were having this little altercation, um, a stack of, of poems and old love letters come up from Blanche's former lover. And she basically encapsulates it like this, or she describes it. These are poems a dead boy wrote. I hurt him the way you would like to hurt me, but you can't. I'm not young and vulnerable anymore, but my young husband was, and I never mind about that. Just give them back to me. So Stanley Kowalski is totally walking all over Blanche's personal space, and he's trying to dig up these secrets, this, this hidden drama, this, these skeletons in her closet. He's challenged by that because Blanche Dubois is sort of putting on this facade that we talked about. And come to page 33, um, Blanche does sort of start to find hope within a new relationship with a man called Mitch. And I'm not going to tell you everything that takes place there because I want you guys to, to read the play. But further conflicts with Stanley sort of arouse, right? Um, and... They do not. They cannot see eye to eye. And not only is, like we said earlier, is Blanche Dubois clashing with Stanley Kowalski's sort of worldview, or vice versa, but there's a there's an element of sort of sexual hidden and unspoken sexual tension between Blanche Dubois and Stanley, but also with Stella and Stanley and Blanche, because Blanche being sisters with Stella. There's a little bit of jealousy there, right, between Stanley's relationship with with Stella or St Stanley's relationship with Stella. There's a little bit of latent jealousy on Blanche's part because Blanche is showing up sort of empty-handed, uh, has no love prospects, um, really has no financial prospects as well. So it's interesting in that sense that Blanche is, you know, sort of at one point in time was sort of the, the more successful sibling, I guess we could say, right? But now the tables have turned and Blanche Dubois is almost coming back with her tail in between her legs. And we get this sense that Blanche Dubois is completely 
you know, resentful of that. She's sort of covering up all of her lack of self-esteem with alcohol. She's kind of a borderline alcoholic or maybe a full-blown alcoholic. And she, all of her her life is sort of shattered amongst all these old belongings and all these old broken memories. And it's just really a true tragedy, uh, a modern tragedy. And and it is, it definitely sort of feeds on that idea of, of the Southern Gothic, right? You know, we've been reading a lot of Faulkner. We'll probably talk about Faulkner up in the upcoming months. Uh, We've been reading Thomas Wolfe, you know, and we just read some some Tennessee Williams. And I'm almost I'm always a little bit hesitant to do analysis of an author that I've only read one work. But Streetcar is probably definitely the best entry play for Tennessee Williams here because it, it's really all encompassing and it really, you know, functions as the complete. Uh, or at least I guess we could say, you know, like I said, we've only read one work, but it's definitely at least I would say 75 Eighty percent of, of of Tennessee Williams's worldview, right? I think once you read Streetcar, it's a great opening of that door in, into sort of the the mindset of of Tennessee Williams. So, uh, just a little quick note on page forty seven: tension continues to arise between Blanche and Stella versus Stanley. The sexual tension that comes up, and Blanche actually sorts of really starts to confront Stella about. The fact that she's questioning this entire relationship. She's basically like, you cannot marry this man. This guy is uncouth. This guy's an animal. Please do not make this mistake. I've made this mistake uh, before. Um, but it's interesting because Blanche is sort of lecturing Stella on, on how to live a better life, how to follow these sort of old, broken, antiquated Southern values that are sort of being phased out, right? And, and we talked a little bit about William Faulkner, right? And, and sort of Faulkner's whole worldview is about the, the ebb and flow and the death and the changing Southern society, the post-bellum society, if we could call it, the loss of those sort of romanticized pre-Civil War uh, Southern dreams. And Blanche Dubois is, is basically a, a ghost, uh, of all of those values, uh, and she basically encapsulates, or or is 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 a, a perfect example of all those southern ghostly values that uh, are now being phased out of the South. They come into contact, but there's also some esoteric things um, on page 51, and and Blanche sort of asks Stanley, "What is your what are your astrological signs?" And they sort of have this esoteric. Uh, back and forth, this little conversation about, uh, you know, being a Virgo versus the goat. Uh, I think Blanche is, is sort of the Virgo, which symbolizes the virgin, which is kind of interesting because Blanche is sort of, we could maybe suspect that she's a virgin, but later in the play, we sort of get some inf conflicting information that suggests that she's far from a virgin. Now, it's possible that some of the stuff is maybe hearsay, some, maybe some of it is slander perhaps, right? But Stanley sort of does a whole... Uh, sort of, uh, what, what, what should we call it? He does a whole deep dive on Blanche Dubois to sort of try to expose her because he resents the fact that Blanche Dubois is sort of carrying this mask around. You know, she's sort of pretending to be one person, but in reality, she's somebody else, right? Um, and I don't even have to tell you what what, the, what her sort of her secret life sort of encapsulates um, because you'll read about that. But just the fact, I mean, we all know those people in our lives that are sort of posing as one person, but they may really be, in fact, somebody else. And sort of the, the character Mitch kind of pops up, and he sort of serves as this example of, of, you know, Southern male chivalry, Southern male hospitality that Blanche is not quite convinced really exists anymore. And she actually has a pretty fair chance with, with Mitch. And Mitch sort of has a little, some maybe some cuckold qualities. You know, he's really going out of his way to really impress Blanche. But Blanche is kind of buying it, even though she is sort of has this really hardened, sort of free-spirited, broken maybe facade. She is uh, you know, confident, or at least she's being slowly seduced by Mitch. So, and then there's some more dialogues about Blanche's former lover. I don't want to uh, get too far into that because it would kind of, that, that's a major spoiler. Um, and then towards the course, towards the end of the play here, we're moving through this fairly quickly. Like I said, it is a very quick play. I mean, it's not a quick play. I mean, you could spend a month on it if you want. You could spend six months really reading between the lines. This is just kind of my first reaction, my first analysis. But like I said, it's very dense. Um, and there's a lot of esoteric themes, a lot of spiritual themes, religious themes, uh, supernatural themes even that, that really come up in this play. But she is 
what we're sort of led to believe or, or what we could probably assume from the get-go is that by Blanche's behavior and the way that she interacts with the other characters, her internal monologue versus the dialogues with the other people in this play is that she's on some level either delusional or mentally ill. And when the polka music starts to reoccur, right, and this trauma comes up and the drinking continues, we really get the sense that Blanche Dubois is, is really you know, falling out of her, her, her current mental state into a, a, another. And then we have this real mortifying sort of symbolism where a Mexican lady shows up with the flowers Los Muertos, and which is which is extremely significant um, because of what's about to occur with with uh, Blanche and and um, Mitch, you know. So what the Mexican lady kind of randomly shows up selling flowers Los Muertos. Am I saying that right? I took Spanish for two years. I ought to know this. Flowers Los Mortos. Yeah. So basically that translates to flowers of the dead. And I think you guys can sort of get a little hint about what that may represent. It sort of represents or encapsulates um, Blanche's, the death of Blanche's former love, the the, the, the man who wrote the, the, the poems from a dead boy, right? The the trauma that Blanche is, is sort of dealing with. But it's also a manifestation of the, 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 the failed relationship that is going to occur with, with Mitch too, right? I'm not going to tell you exactly why that fails, but it does fail. Um, and then towards the end of the play on page 96, without getting giving too much away, and I, I'm not going to give this away completely, but uh, sort of a final conflict, a final act occurs between Stanley and Blanche. And right after that scene... Um, it, you know, it's quite heartbreaking because that's really where it all kind of ends. And like I said, we're, we're kind of doing a sort of a broad sweep of the major themes. We talked about the, the, the brokenness of Blanche Dubois' character on an emotional, a mental, and a spiritual level. But it's also including she's carrying around this sort of philosophy of the death of Southern, Southern values. You know, Blanche is almost naive in the sense that she is still on the cuff of those old uh, you know, antebellum sort of era values or even postbellum values. But now we're into the modern times. You know, things have changed. Um, not only is Blanche Dubois's life changed, but her whole family, you know, she's sort of been, been set to fail in a sense from the beginning because she was raised in this really sort of uh, privilege, I guess we could say, I hate to use that word. What would be a more old fashioned word? This sort of gaudy, um, you know, aristocratic perhaps lifestyle, this really wealthy lifestyle, um, but it, she was not e equipped on a mental and spiritual level to really handle all that. You know, she was she was too uh, too sheltered, perhaps right. And by the time uh, you know the plantation is sort of going under, uh, Blanche doesn't really have the means to function in the post bellum society, right? Or, or, or I guess we could say, you know, because obviously this took place way after post bellum, but she cannot really shed the 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 you know the the lifestyle. You know, she's still struggling with that aristocratic post bellum Southern privilege lifestyle. I guess you could say, uh, but everything in the wake of of the death of, of the loss of that Bell Rev, that plantation, has been nothing but but turmoil for Blanche Dubois. And you know, like I said, if you read the play you'll really, really understand sort of the struggle and the tragedy, the bitter, hopeless tragedy of Blanche Dubois' uh, predicament in this story and the way that she constantly clashes with these other characters. But she also, Blanche Dubois also has sort of this these delusions of grandeur that she is somehow more upright or more above you know, sort of morally than everybody else around her. But she's got, like you said, we got she's got these skeletons in her closet. And then we have the final act, um, and that, that pretty much sort of encapsulates the end of the play. And Blanche Dubois ends up leaving Belle Rev into another phase of her life. And it's almost sort of a, a continuation of, of Blanche's suffering. Just a true tragedy. And I don't want to give too much away. But like I said, there's a lot, there's a, there's a lot of esoteric stuff. There's a lot of things you could sort of read between the lines. We sort of got the supernatural element 
of the ghost of 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 uh, Blanche Dubois' former lover haunting her. Well, we also got this sort of Southern Gothic omnipresent haunting um, the the Bell Rev Plantation. You know, sort of the way that it's. Uh, held in high esteem in, in Blanche Dubois' memory. She'll never be able to recapture those times. And then we have sort of the supernatural element of, uh, of how death manifests itself in Blanche Dubois' you know, current life, you know, the way that, especially when the flowers, uh, Los Mortos show up, flowers of the dead, that's an extremely ominous sign, extremely ominous doctrine. Uh, from the perpetual mystical microcosm, as Inquisition would say, but it's just a very bad sign for, for Blanche Dubois' predicament, right? And we also have sort of the, the esoteric symbolic elements of of the the, the star signs, of uh, astrological signs of Blanche Dubois, her astrology sort of clashing directly with, with Stanley. And also the tragedy that occurs at the end of the book Obviously, I'm not making any any excuses for the the horrible thing that happened, but on some level, I, at least I was. I think some readers have been left with the question of whether Blanche was somewhat of a willing participant, because uh, you know not only in in the theme of sort of um, latent sexual erotic tension, but also in the way that the way that Stanley sort of acts as this catalyst to finalize Blanche's demise. And almost that Blanche sort of succumbed and sort of accepted or, or, or knew that this was, you know, Stanley's purpose. And this was uh, Blanche's purpose for being at Elysian Fields um, to sort of have uh, one last desperate attempt at, at sanity and at, to sort of trying to desperately crawling through the, the darkened walls to try to find the lost pieces of her soul, the lost pieces of, of, of Southern hospitality. Uh, but it, it's so tragic because it never exists. But at the same time, Blanche is not, she's a victim of her circumstances. She's obviously a victim of some of the people that betray her in this, in this play, right? But she's also not completely helpless and she's ex an extremely self-destructive character in that sense. But that's why she's a profound character. That's why people like to play this character that's why you know this this play is so important the southern literature dialogue right um because it just encapsulates not only the fall of real human people but also the fall of the sort of this this lofty fantastical uh, you know, according to some people, Southern philosophy or Southern worldview that is obviously no longer a thing and was was obviously being phased out. Uh, so, yeah, just our little contribution to a little bit of Southern Gothic literature, more modern, a little more modern than Faulkner, perhaps. Uh, but this, this dates back to 1947, so it is rather old, but sort of the way that the language is written, the way that the characters interact with each other, it's pretty linear. linear. It's not sort of a dis you know, a, a nonlinear, disjointed, unreliable sort of narrator type deal that you might get with Faulkner or some, maybe perhaps Arthur Miller. It's very, you know, consistent and, and digestible in that sense. So even if you're not real familiar with Southern literature, I think uh, Streetcar Named Desire is a wonderful place to start. Leave your thoughts and comments down below. Let me know what you think about Tennessee Williams. What's your favorite Tennessee Williams play? Let me know some other Southern playwrights or Southern novels and, and writers that you would like us to explore on this channel. I'm really excited that we're getting this video up tonight, and we will see you all in the next one.